At the crossroads, rethinking the role of education in preventing and countering violent extremism Thomas K. Samuel. This chapter looks at the issue of violent extremists and terrorists targeting the education sector, and subsequently recommends steps that the education sector can take to prevent and counter violent extremism PCVE, amongst students. Educational institutions in general and students in particular have been targeted by violent extremists and terrorists. Paradoxically, they have sought to physically attack and destroy institutions of learning, while at times, they have actively sought to radicalize and subsequently recruit students to join their cause. Short case studies of attacks on educational institutions in different parts of the world, as well as instances of young people being radicalized in schools and universities, are presented and evaluated. Emphasis is then put on revisiting the idea of education and envisioning a greater role for it to play in PCVE among students. A case is presented for the education sector to take the lead in PCVE among the youth, given education's strategic advantages in terms of coverage in reaching the youth, duration of contact with the youth, and access into the cognitive and emotional makeup of the youth. A whole of education approach is proposed, whereby the educational institutes will identify specific areas of the student's cognitive and emotional spheres in which to build PCVE-related firewalls in a systematic and comprehensive manner. In this proposed PCVE approach, teachers will take a redesigned role that would focus more on mentoring and guiding, preparing a safe space to initiate discussions, and building trust and credibility to maximize their ability to impart the contents to the students. Additionally, given the complexities involved in reaching out to the youth on the subject of PCVE, the role of the teachers would be augmented by leveraging on the skill set, experience, appeal, and support of select individuals such as rehabilitated terrorists, former victims of terrorism, social media influencers, and role models. Keywords, counter-terrorism, preventing and countering violent extremism, PCVE, education, children, terrorist attacks, radicalization, schools. Education is powerful. This has been recognized not only by governments and societies but also extremist and violent organizations. Given this, the education sector has always been the battleground for political, religious, and ideological movements, including violent extremist and terrorist groups, to impose their views and values on society. Such groups infiltrate the education sector to manipulate and recruit based on core human identities such as ethnicity, religion, race, and gender. They actively propagate rigid and extreme interpretations of religion and culture to help fashion an intolerant and violent environment for young and impressionable target audiences. One hence, educational institutes are seen as a potential target that offers under one roof thousands of potential recruits for indoctrination and recruitment into violent extremism and terrorism. Governments and authorities are beginning to recognize this vulnerability in educational institutes and are attempting to plug the holes and prevent such institutions from becoming the breeding grounds of violent extremism. Whilst this is undoubtedly necessary, the authorities would be missing a golden opportunity should they not realize that not only are educational institutions vulnerable to violent extremism but ironically, given the right support, they have the potential of becoming citadels for preventing and countering violent extremism PCVE, among the youth. Simply put, schools and universities can move from being possible breeding grounds for potential sympathizers and recruits to instead active PCVE. This chapter will argue that the best defense against extremist ideologies taking over institutions of learning is to develop an education system that will prepare and equip the students to debate and defeat extremist thoughts. Scope, Parameters and Definitions This chapter will firstly consider the state of vulnerability of students in educational institutes towards violent extremism, by looking at case studies, as well as the literature on the subject. Secondly, the possible interventions, via education, in preventing and countering the trajectory into terrorism will be discussed. 
The institutions of learning that are covered in this chapter include public schools and universities, but will exclude religious or faith-based educational institutions. I am mindful of the wiry observations of Schmid and Jongman that authors have spilled almost as much ink, while trying to define the concept of terrorism, as the actors of terrorism have spilled blood, to and would therefore borrow Resolution 49 60th, which the UN adopted during the General Assembly. It defines terrorism as, criminal acts intended or calculated to provoke a state of terror in the general public, a group of persons or particular persons for political purposes, free shifting from defining, terrorism, to, violent extremism, like the proverbial moving from the, frying pan into the fire, is wrought with challenges. The Federal Bureau of Investigations defines violent extremism as, encouraging, condoning, justifying, or supporting the commission of a violent act to achieve political, ideological, religious, social or economic goals. For the United Nations Plan of Action to Prevent Violent Extremism observed that, violent extremism is a diverse phenomenon, admitting that it was, without clear definition, while acknowledging that it, encompasses a wider category of manifestations, when compared to terrorism. Point five. Finally, in the context of this chapter, Radicalization refers to the pathway or process that mobilizes a young person to support and ultimately engage in acts of political violence. Education as a target. The targeting of education in general, and institutions of learning in particular, by violent extremists, is not a new phenomenon. Political entrepreneurs and agitators have always viewed educational institutions as recruiting grounds, but also as a potential threat to their ideologies. The persecution of Arab and Jewish scholars in Spain during the 15th century, the suppression of Jewish and socialist intellectuals by the Nazis in Germany, and the mass-targeted killings of scholars by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, are but a few examples in history. Point six. In 2010, UNESCO published a detailed study that looked at political and military violence against the whole spectrum of the education system worldwide. Point seven. The report highlights that possible motives for such attacks include Bulletin with seat symbols of the imposition of an input with your value, culture, philosophy, or ethnic identity, but preventing education of those, but preventing any form of education, but targeting what was seen to be symbols of government per and one of the most visible symbols of state authority, bullet, undermining the confidence in government authority over a particular area, bullet, extracting revenge for civilian killings, bullet, undermining the functioning of the education system, bullet, abduction of children and at times adults with the intent of recruiting them to provide forced labor. Sexual services and or logistical support bullet, abductions for ransom bullet, sexual violence by members of armed groups, soldiers or security forces as a tactic of war or out of disrespect for gender rights bullet, attacking students and academics with the intent to silence political opposition or prevent the voicing of alternative views bullet, attacking students and academics to specifically silence human rights campaigns bullet, attacking academics to limit research on sensitive topics, and bullet destruction of education institutions by invading forces as a tactic of defeating the enemy and destroying education buildings in revenge. Point eight additional motivations identified in the UNESCO study include media coverage that can be generated for the violent extremist groups as a result of an attack on an institution of learning, as well as these of causing extensive damage to what are usually only lightly defended or totally unprotected targets affiliated with the government. Point nine research indicates that there has been a rise in attacks on education in recent years. In 2018, the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack GCPEA, published a STUDY-10 that was built on two previous studies published by UNESCO in 2007-2010, as well as a third study published by the GCPEA in 2014. The authors of the studies compared global patterns of attacks on education during the 2013 to 2017 period to those perpetrated earlier and noted that there appears to be an increase in attacks worldwide. Here are some examples. Past attacks on educational institutions Beslan School, Russia, on 1 September 2004, armed Chechen rebels took approximately 1,200 children and adults hostage at school number one in Beslan, North Ossetia, Russia. The hostage takers were members of the Chechen group called the Riyad as Salahin Martyrs Brigade, which had been founded and led by Chechen warlord Shamil Basayev. 
the hostage takers demanded the recognition of Czechia's independence from Russia and the immediate withdrawal of Russian troops from the region. Point one one on 3 September 2004, the Russian security forces stormed the building with tanks, incendiary rockets, and other heavy weapons. Point one two at the end of the siege, 334 people, 186 of them children, were killed. Point one three Garissa University College, Kenya, on 2 April 2015. Al Shabaab militants attacked the university in Garissa, Kenya, taking 700 undergraduates as hostages. In the end, they killed 148 people, 142 of them students, and injured another 79.14. Two days after the attack, Al Shabaab issued a statement threatening Kenyan citizens with another bloodbath, saying that they would stop at nothing to avenge the death of their Muslim brothers until and unless the Kenyan government ceases its operations, likely referring to the Kenyan army's participation in the African Union's mission in Somalia against the group. They also warned the Kenyan public that they would be targeting schools, universities, workplaces and even homes for condoning your government's oppressive policies by failing to speak out against them and for reinforcing their policies by electing them. Close quote 15 It is also significant to note that as a consequence of the attack, 96 out of a total of 150 primary and secondary schools were closed in Garissa County due to security fears among both students and teachers. Point 16 the psychological fear that such an attack had caused was the cause of a further tragedy. On 25 March 2016, two undergraduates fighting at Kenyatta University led hundreds of panicking students, thinking it was another terrorist attack to cause a stampede, leaving 38 students injured. Army Public School, Pakistan, on 16 December 2014, fighters linked to the Terakai Taliban TTP, attacked the Army Public School in Peshawar, northwestern Pakistan. Armed with automatic weapons and grenades and wearing explosive belts, they entered the school by scaling a wall, and then proceeded to go from one classroom to the next, opening fire indiscriminately on the school children. In total, the fighters killed 149 individuals, of which 132 were students, with ages ranging from 8 to 18.17. A military spokesperson highlighted the fact that all terrorists wore suicide vests, were heavily armed, made no demands, and were also stocked with rations, indicated that they did not come to take any hostages. Point one eight. According to retired general and security analyst Talat Massoud, the militants were very much aware that they did not have the capacity to strike at the heart of the military, and therefore chose to go after soft targets, such as the school where most children were from military families. Point one nine. This was calculated to cause a great psychological impact. Justifying the attack, the TTP spokesman Muhammad Omar Khorasani was reported to have said, we targeted the school because the army targets our families. We want them to feel our pain. Close quote 20 The Peshawar school attack was called a massacre of the innocents, and the incident was seen as Pakistan's 9-11th moment. Close quote 21 The Chibok schoolgirls, Nigeria, on 14 April 2014, Boko Haram kidnapped 276 female students who had gone to take exams from a government secondary school for girls in the town of Chibok, Borno State, Nigeria. 22 During the assault, 57 girls managed to jump and escape from the trucks in which they were being driven away. The remaining 219 girls were abducted by the kidnappers. Boko Haram leader Abubakar Shekau reportedly said that all the girls that had been taken had converted to Islam and had been married off. Close quote 23 As of March 2020, out of the 276 girls who were kidnapped, 103 girls were released, reportedly in exchange for ransom money and prisoners, and four girls were said to have escaped later on their own. There remain another 112 girls unaccounted for. Point two four. One of the girls who had escaped reported that during the early stages of the kidnapping, the militants had told the girls, you're only coming to school for prostitution. Boko, Western education is haram, forbidden, so what are you doing in school? Close quote 25 The Chibok kidnappings raised international awareness about the atrocities of Boko Haram in Nigeria, but did little to stem the flow of more kidnappings, as witnessed by the abduction of the 300 elementary school children in the AMASAK 26, and the kidnapping of the 110 boarding school GIRLS 27 in Apchi.28 in April 2018. UNICEF highlighted that since 2013, Boko Haram had kidnapped more than 1,000 children in Nigeria.
the UN agency appealed for an end to attacks on schools in Nigeria, and said that young girls in particular, were especially vulnerable to attacks by the militant group, and had been consistently targeted and exposed to brutal violence in their schools. Close quote UNICEF Nigeria went on to stress that the repeated attacks against children in schools, were unconscionable. Close quote UNICEF reiterated that children have the right to education and protection, and the classroom must be a place where they are safe from harm. Close quote. Bacha Khan University, Pakistan. On the 20th of January 2016, four gunmen opened fire at the Bacha Khan University in Chasada, Pakistan, killing 21 people. The four terrorists scaled the walls of the university and then opened fire on students and teachers. A few days before the attack, the authorities had closed some schools in Peshawar as they had reason to believe that an attack was imminent. Point 30 Chasada is less than 40 kilometers away from Peshawar, where on the 16th of December 2014, fighters linked with the TTP attacked the Army Public School. 31 In a follow-up video, Umar Mansour, a Pakistani Taliban spokesman, vowed to target schools throughout Pakistan. He elaborated that his fighters had attacked the university because this is the place where lawyers are made, this is the place that produces military officers, this is the place that produces members of the parliament, all of whom challenge Allah's sovereignty. 32 He went to say that instead of targeting the armed enemy soldiers, his group would now change their focus and target the nurseries that produce such people and warn that. Together with his fighters, we will continue to attack schools, colleges and universities across Pakistan as these are the foundations that produce apostates. We will target and demolish the foundations, 33 susceptibility of the youth to radicalization young people between the ages of 15 and 25 are vulnerable 34 to following extremist ideologies as they are at a developmental age where they are searching to discover their own identities, bolster their self-confidence and find meaning in their lives. This age group is also quite action-orientated and young people are oftentimes characterized as being more prone to taking greater risks. Point 35 Their minds are also more susceptible to external influences than those who are more experienced and therefore they have fewer built-in safeguards against extremism. Hence, for youth, the limited ability to compare belief systems and the lack of capacity of many to view things other than black or white, translates to the premise that a radical ideology does not seem radical at all. 36 This susceptibility is well recognized by violent extremists and, consequently, this vulnerability is very much exploited. Terrorist recruits getting younger Young people serve as a vital source of support for terrorist groups. Point 37 In Sri Lanka, the Liberation Tamil Tigers of Elam LTTE, have actively recruited children into their ranks. Tamil children were said to have been targeted for recruitment from age 11. The LTTE was reported to routinely visit Tamil homes to inform parents that they must provide a child for the movement. 38 parents were bullied and threatened to comply with the LTTE's request of forced conscription of their children. Point 39 children were at the onset recruited into the LTTE's baby brigade, but later integrated into other units. For example, the elite Leopard Brigade was said to have been formed from children taken from LTTE-run orphanages. It allegedly became one of LTTE's fiercest fighting units. In 1991, a major LTTE military operation against the Elephant Pass military complex was said to have used waves of children drawn from the Baby Brigade. The operation resulted in an estimated 550 deaths of LTTE members, the majority of them being children. 
There were also reports that 40 to 60 percent of the LTT soldiers killed during the conflict in the 1990s were children under the age of 18.40 children were also allegedly used for massed frontal attacks in major battles. Those between the ages of 12 and 14 were used to massacre women and children in remote rural villages and some as young as 10 years of age were even used as assassins. Point 41 in Spain, the Euskada Tarascadasuna, ETA, Basque Homeland and Freedom emerged in 1959 as a student resistance movement opposed to General Franco's military dictatorship. The group increased its youth members under the age of 20 from 9% in the 1970s to approximately 60% of the organization by 2005.42 its push to seek out new members from a younger demographic, which was a marked change from the past when the ETA was very selective in its recruitment, has ensured its continuity. Point 43 in fact. The EDA's ability to revitalize itself as a whole has been largely due to its own youth organizations, Jarai, followed by Haika and Seji.44 The ETA survived until 2018 but had declared a ceasefire in 2010. In India, Samuel highlighted the case of the Mumbai attacks in November 2008, in which 10 coordinated assaults left 165 civilians and security personnel dead. He pointed out that one of the common threads that bound the attackers together was their relatively young age. Besides the eldest terrorist, who was 28 years old, the average age of the remaining nine terrorists was only 23 with the leader, Ismail Khan, being 25 years old. Point 45 in the Philippines, the Abu Sayyaf group, ASG, has been fighting for an independent Islamic state for the country's Muslim minority. Point 46 The founder of the ASG, Abdurajak Janjalani was in his early 20s when he was radicalized and only 26 when he formed the ASG. His replacement was his younger brother Qaddafi Janjalani, who led ASG when he was only 22. In 2009, the ASG was led by Yasser Igerson, who was only 21 years old when he joined the movement. Point 47 Besides the ASG, the Raja Soleiman movement, ISM, which originated from a cell of militant students and teachers at a religious school in Luzon, was founded by Ahmed Santos, who had been indoctrinated when he was only 21 years old. The ISM was infamous for its role in carrying out the Super Ferry 14 bombing on the 27th of February 2004, which led to the death of 116 people and is to date considered the worst maritime terrorist attack. The alleged perpetrator of the act was Redento Kane Delosa, who was in his mid-20s.48 in Iraq, Al-Qaeda had also featured young people prominently. The group had developed videos targeting youth for recruitment. The videos featured the group discussing their strategy for training children to become suicide bombers and showcased young boys making statements promoting slaughter and declaring their allegiance to Al-Qaeda. Videos were released containing scenes where children would interrogate and execute victims, plant improvised explosive devices IEDs, and conduct sniper attacks against security forces. 49 also in Iraq, insurgent groups were alleged to have paid between US $50 and US $100 to teenagers for planting IEDs and shooting a mortar or firing a machine gun at coalition troops. Point 50 The number of children involved in terrorism in Iraq was clearly seen when during the first 12 months of the US invasion in Iraq, the US forces had detained more than 100 juveniles, a number which increased to 600 juveniles as of 2008. Radicalization in schools History has shown us that school children have oftentimes participated in various organizations that promote or carry out acts of violence. Their roles have varied from offering logistical support, serving as mules or lookouts, to fundraising and actual participation in attacks. In Indonesia, 
violent extremists are deliberately targeting and recruiting students from high schools. Point 52 This is not surprising, as 23% of the entire population of Indonesia are in high school, making this a key location for recruitment for violent extremists. From this author's research in Southeast Asia, schools have oftentimes been the go-to source for terrorists to actively radicalize and recruit. Point 53 For instance, hundreds of Indonesians, Malaysians and Filipinos, many of them students, volunteered as Mujahideen warriors to fight in Afghanistan and subsequently returned radicalized. Point 54 B. Singh. A university professor from Singapore observed a growing trend of students being radicalized in Indonesia. 55 In light of this, Indonesia's Vice President Maraf Amin was tasked by President Joko Widodo to lead a government campaign to counter this phenomenon. Vice President Amin highlighted that extremist ideologies had even reached preschool playgroups, observing that the challenge was getting bigger because radicalism has a growing influence on society, not just among civil servants but also students. We even received reports that it has already found its way to the PAUD, preschool playgroups, 56 Benny Mamoto, a retired Indonesia police general, confirmed this, saying that they, radical groups, entered into all layers of society, including education. 57 Indonesian violent extremists gain access into schools by assigning their members to join student or youth organizations and subsequently acting as mentors to youths and undergraduates with the purpose of recruiting them in the future. Point 58 In the Philippines, this phenomenon of recruiting youth from institutions of learning is not new either and has been going on since the 1980s. According to Ahmed, a former terrorist in the Philippines, Communist-based insurgents exploited clubs and schools to target and radicalize Filipino youth, specifically those around 17 or 18 years of age. This method of exploiting the education system was subsequently adapted and fine-tuned by other Muslim-based extremist groups. The ASG, for example, had a policy of selecting only the brightest and toughest students who were willing to fight for their religious cause, 59 other Muslim groups established religious schools and then provided financial scholarships, making it extremely attractive for students to study in such institutions. Reportedly, Muhammad Jamal Khalifa, the brother-in-law of Osama bin Laden, had established a school in the southern Philippines with the express intention of recruiting young people for jihad. The youths who began studying in these religious schools did so with hopes of receiving an education to become qualified religious teachers, but were, unfortunately, deceived and subsequently indoctrinated. Point 60 in 2007, the challenge of youth involvement in terrorism was highlighted by Jonathan Evans, MI5 director, when he stated that extremists were methodically and intentionally targeting young people and children in the UK and that groups like Al-Qaeda were recruiting children as young as 15 to wage a deliberate campaign of terror in the UK. He further warned that extremists and terrorists were radicalizing, indoctrinating and grooming young, vulnerable people to carry out acts of terrorism and that urgent action was needed on the part of the authorities to protect its children from exploitation by violent extremists. 61 in the same vein, in March 2009, the UK Association of Chief Police Officers ACPO, highlighted that 200 schoolchildren in Britain, some as young as 13 had been reported as having been groomed by radicalizers and hence had become susceptible to violent extremism. Point 62 In light of this, schools in the UK have been mandated by law, Section 26 of the 2015 Counterterrorism and Security Act and are required to have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. This controversial duty is known as the prevent duty. The responsibilities for schools include training teachers and staff to be able to identify and recognize children who might be vulnerable to radicalization, and promote fundamental British values that would enable the students to challenge the narrative of violent extremists or terrorists. Furthermore, teachers and staff are required to assess the risk of the students being drawn into terrorism and build resilience in students by providing them safe spaces to discuss controversial subjects, 
while educating them on how they could influence and participate in decision-making. Point 63 Radicalization in Universities In the case of universities, Samuel and his research on undergraduate radicalization in Southeast Asia highlighted that terrorists and extremists have been looking at institutions of higher learning and their students as a source of recruitment and support. In the eyes of terrorist leaders, such undergraduate students are seen as a strategic target audience and that by recruiting them, the terrorist network would be able to build up a support base amongst a group that might one day become influencers themselves in the wider community and future leaders. 64 In a European study, Peter Newman observes that universities are places of vulnerability due to the fact that undergraduates are young, often away from home for the first time feeling quite lost and often experiencing a sort of crisis of identity. According to him, this makes it easy for extremist groups to pick them up and to say to them, come along to our meeting, we are like you. 65 This was also reiterated by Kumar Ramakrishna, Nanyang University, Singapore, who notes that the majority of undergraduates who are young are still maturing both emotionally and intellectually making them susceptible to idealistic appeals from charismatic ideologues who seem to have clear-cut answers for the confusion that these undergraduates might feel about the world around them. 66 The reach and significance that violent extremists and terrorists can have in a university can clearly be seen in Afghanistan where groups like the Taliban, meaning students, take full advantage of their access to universities to exploit the mobilizing power of student protests to advance their vested interests. They do this by developing a patron-client relationship with undergraduates to provide assistance and financial support to undergraduate associations as well as opportunities after graduation from university. In return, some university undergraduates promise to become mouthpieces of violent extremists for advocating and disseminating their rhetoric, propaganda, and ideology within the university environment. Point 67 Universities are at times also used as a propaganda arena by foreign students and lecturers from countries in conflict zones. In such instances, Lecture sessions are often hijacked to preach and explain the injustices and atrocities taking place at home and abroad. Over a certain period of time, such lectures can shape, mold and convince undergraduate students into believing that terrorism as propaganda of the deed is the only route available for addressing grievances. Point 68 Radicalization Pathways of Youth Better understanding of how and why young people are radicalized and join violent extremist groups is essential in developing strategies on how to prevent and counter their radicalization into violent extremism. Point 69 Young people join violent extremists and terrorist groups for various reasons. Oftentimes, they have little choice in the matter as they are forced into joining. In Iraq, ISIS kidnapped thousands of children from orphanages, schools, and even their homes, while also taking over existing schools and teaching their own curriculum. Point 70 Over one-third of the 6,800 Yazidis that were captured by ISIS in Sinjar in 2014 were made up of children under the age of 14. Another 800 to 900 children were said to have been kidnapped from Mosul for religious and military training. Point 71 Boko Haram in Nigeria has frequently used mass kidnappings including the infamous abduction of the 276 Chibok schoolgirls in April 2014 and 110 Dapchi schoolgirls in March 2018.72 in the case of Somalia. In 1997 alone, Al-Shabaab utilized detention, violence, and intimidation to recruit approximately 1,777 youths. Point 73 The UK government, while acknowledging that there is no single path to radicalization, identified four possible contributing factors that can lead to a young person being radicalized into violent extremism. The factors include, one, exposure to an ideology that appears to sanction, legitimize, or require violence, often by providing tipping points to violent radicalization. Research has also shown common indicators for violent extremists which might also apply in the context of young people undergoing religious radicalization. For example, 
Gartenstein, Ross, and Grossman conducted an empirical examination of radicalized individuals in the UK and US to discern the process that lead to them becoming radicalized. They found that firstly, those who were radicalized were familiarized with a very rigid, conservative and legalistic interpretation of religion in which a strong focus was placed on the literal interpretations of holy texts. Secondly, they strictly followed and trust only select religious authorities who were deemed authentic and credible while everybody else was considered a fraud or their teachings were presented as a watered-down and inauthentic version of the true faith. Thirdly, they believed that there were irreconcilable differences which had led to a divide between Islam and the West and that a clash of civilizations was therefore inevitable. Fourthly, there was little acceptance or tolerance with any party that did not fully conform with their theological doctrines and beliefs. Fifthly, violent extremists took it upon themselves to impose their religious doctrines and beliefs on everybody else, and any means towards this end was justified. Finally, there was an element of political radicalization as violent extremists believe that there is a conspiracy by the West against Islam to destroy the religion both physically and morally. 75 Whole of Education Approach Rethinking education in PCVE and terrorism there is a growing realization that solely focusing on a military approach or hard power to prevent and counter violent extremism is a strategy that is no longer tenable. Hence, national and international strategies in PCVE and terrorism are focusing more on conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. Point 76 In that regard, education has been described as a moral enterprise that has the capacity to develop and shape the hearts and minds of an individual in society. Point 77 This, in turn, could potentially be a template for a viable and impactful strategy to address, and possibly reverse the threat of violent extremism, particularly among the youth. As a result of this, schools and universities have gained growing importance as platforms for different kinds of prevention protocols or counterterrorism strategies, 78 echoing this, in 2013. Former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair highlighted that violent extremism would never be defeated by security measures, alone, adding that only the education of young people can achieve its demise. 79 Similarly, the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy emphasizes the pivotal role of education by reiterating that an effective counterterrorism strategy must take steps to promote a culture of peace, justice and human development, ethnic, national and religious tolerance and respect for all religions, religious values, beliefs or cultures by establishing and encouraging, as appropriate, education and public awareness programs involving all sectors of society, 80 in the same sense, the Ankara Memorandum on Good Practices for a Multi-Sectoral Approach to Countering. Violent extremism was formulated to address the role of government institutions, agencies, and civil society in CVE. The memorandum reaffirms the role that educational institutions can serve as an important platform in countering violent extremism, 81 noting that critical thinking skills, civic education, community engagement, and volunteerism in schools have a potential in turning the tide against violent extremism and terrorism. 82 UN Security Council Resolution 1624, 2005 also stress the important role of educational institutions in fostering an environment which is not conducive to incitement of terrorism. 83 In light of this, considering integrating PCVE into the education curriculum makes eminent sense. The case of non-violent extremists being radical in and of itself is not wrong. For example, giving non-whites and women the right to vote and the emancipation of slaves were in 19th century Europe, considered to be radical ideas and seen as going against the status quo. Thankfully, they were championed by radical political parties, brought to pass, and currently are accepted as the norm in most societies. 84 Radicalism is not the same as extremism although these two concepts are often used interchangeably. The popularity of the concept of radicalization as a term for mobilization to support or engage in acts violence has given radicalism a bad name which is, 
from the point of view of the history of ideas, partly undeserved. Radical political parties emerged after the French Revolution and stood for equality, secularism, republicanism, and democracy. Extremism, on the other hand, emerged in the 20th century and is associated with fascism and communism and other authoritarian and totalitarian movements, including religious movements, some of them violent, others not, or not yet. Point 85 is Beauty de Rear, HT, or Party of Liberation, for example, targets university undergraduates in certain countries, rejects the idea of the nation state and the principles of democracy and instead advocates a return to a caliphate-style theocracy which H.T. claims to bring about without utilizing violence. Point 86 However, Ed Hussein, a former member of H.T., observed that certain worldviews even when held without advocating violence, provides the mood music to which suicide bombers dance. 87 Echoing this, Abu Bakar Ba'asire, when asked about his role in motivating terrorists in Indonesia declared, I am only a craftsman selling knives. I am not responsible for how those knives are used. 88. He was clear that his role was just a push in. Extremist idea and how that idea was subsequently interpreted and followed through was not his responsibility. Hence, there is a growing concern that extremist groups are developing and disseminating dangerous ideas such as the supremacy of a certain race or religion the notion that their identity is being attacked by the other, or even that principles of democracy and election are against God's will. It is significant to note that developing, holding, and disseminating such ideas is in most jurisdictions, not a crime and some would even say, play the role of a safety valve that allows the youth to express themselves without necessarily resorting to actual violence. On the other hand, there are also those who argue that such ideas act as a possible conveyor belt into violent radicalization. 89 While the final outcome of some of these non-violent extremist ideas that are being developed, marketed, and disseminated by extremists to the youth is uncertain what should our response be? Who would be in the best position to facilitate and develop a comprehensive counter-response to that being pushed by the extremist? It is argued here that educational institutions can be equipped to lead this charge in the marketplace of ideas for the hearts and minds of our youth. The argument for education as the primary line of defense in PCVE among the youth when formulating strategies and countering terrorism, agencies such as law enforcement authorities play an active and often leading role. There is a growing realization that a soft power approach, and in particular, the use of education, is a promising way to move forward in PCVE. That being the case, national governments and the international community must not just pay lip service but ensure that when they pledge for education to be given a greater role in PCVE, they also ought to implement policies to that end. However, before education can play a more prominent and pivotal role in PCVE, there needs to be the realization among policymakers that violent extremists and terrorists are indeed targeting and recruiting young people. Secondly, it must be recognized that students and educational institutions are vulnerable to such efforts being undertaken by extremists. Thirdly, while being susceptible to the radicalization process, institutions of learning, with proper planning and support, can be hardwired to develop in their students a mental and emotional firewall, capable of withstanding indoctrination, should it occur, carried out by violent and non-violent extremists. For this potential to be realized, there needs to be a rethinking in the way that PCVE is viewed in the education sector. Education can no longer be seen as a secondary line of defense, rather, it must be viewed as the primary line of defense against violent extremism and terrorism, for no terrorist attack can take place until and unless potential terrorists are identified, indoctrinated, and recruited. Newman's definition of radicalization, what goes on before the bomb goes off 90, indicates that before the physical battle even begins, radicalization must occur and it is precisely 1. Identify specific areas, i.e., cognitive and emotional spheres, where they intend to build resilience and fortitude. 2. 
target and teach specific qualities in relation to age levels, for example, focusing on developing qualities such as tolerance and compassion during the primary schooling while emphasizing empathy, appreciation of diversity and critical thinking during the secondary slash tertiary schooling, etc. 3. Seek outside assistance in reinforcing PCVE content to students, for example, by utilizing rehabilitated terrorists, former victims of terrorism, moderate religious and spiritual mentors, social media influencers, and celebrities to heighten the reach, appeal, and impact of PCVE narratives. 4. Develop a syllabus on PCVE that covers all the relevant issues specific to a country and ensure its continuity for the student from primary to tertiary levels. 5. Train specialized teachers at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels not only to mentor and guide the students in discussing PCVE issues, but also in being able to recognize and detect possible signs of radicalization. 6. Develop and build networks of specialized expertise, for example psychologists, youth counselors, religious leaders, and even the police, for teachers to seek help or even to refer students who are showing signs of worrying behavior which might be beyond their ability to handle. 7. Develop a monitoring and evaluation mechanism to assess, rectify, and modify all the efforts being undertaken at the working and policy levels within the education sector. The potential of the education sector in facilitating and developing policies and interventions in the field of PCVE for the nation has yet to be fully explored. Given education's reach and daily access, via nursery, primary, secondary, vocational slash tertiary schooling, into the lives of a huge percentage of the population, i.e., from the ages 6 to 17 and even beyond, for a reasonably lengthy period, particularly during the formative and vital years of an individual, it would be a tremendous waste, if more is not expected and indeed done by national education agencies when it comes to PCVE. Essentially, a holistic and comprehensive approach is needed when looking at education and PCVE. A whole of education PCVE approach should seek to impart and instill values and knowledge associated with PCVE in a comprehensive and methodical manner, through various approaches and interventions, spanning the student's entire academic and extracurricular journey, from nursery to university. Integrating PCVE in the school-slash-university curriculum as said before, the goal of the education sector should be twofold. Firstly, to protect a student from violent extremism while in an institution of learning and secondly, to impart and equip students with all that is necessary to prevent them from ever considering violent extremism in the future. Given this lofty ambition, it is essential that the PCVE component be integrated into the entire curriculum. It should also include vocational and religious elements of the student while in school and possibly into higher learning institutions such as the universities. PCVE should essentially be aimed to be carried out principally as a part of everyday schoolwork. 91. It is important to note that for a PCVE mindset to be successfully imparted on a student, it is not just knowledge that has to be transferred, but also values. Both knowledge and values, if properly constructed and delivered, have within them powerful defensive and even offensive characteristics that can protect an individual against succumbing to extremism. However, these components of knowledge and values, if merely shoved onto the student, would look like propaganda or preaching and would greatly diminish their effectiveness. Hence, what is needed is a vehicle to carry both these components of knowledge and values into the hearts and minds of the student. The possible vehicles that could be utilized to carry these two components would include 1. Academic subjects like history, ethics slash moral education, philosophy, and religious studies. 2. Study of biographies of noted individuals as well as organizations. 3. Sports. 4. Extracurricular activities within uniformed bodies, clubs, and societies. 5. Volunteerism. 6. Student exchange programs. And 7. 
promoting better understanding and appreciation of different cultures, practices, and religions. These approaches will be discussed below. PCVE vehicles in schools There are seven PCVE vehicles that will now be discussed. Academic subjects Academic subjects in schools and universities like history, ethics slash moral education, philosophy, and religious studies can integrate PCVE components in their content. These subjects already touch upon issues such as violence, conflict resolution, the history of individuals slash groups manipulating religion, etc. With proper planning and training, these academic subjects can be utilized to create knowledge and impart values on the sacredness of life and the total disregard that terrorists have for people's lives. Imparting PCVE elements in biographies of noted individuals and organizations young people are oftentimes less interested in theories, concepts, and models than more interested in real-life individuals. Violent extremists are fully aware of this and oftentimes exploit this by painting their leaders and fighters as courageous heroes and martyrs, fighting for a noble cause. In this regard, PCVE initiatives need to showcase positive role models that young people can adopt as their heroes. Individuals such as Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela and Florence Nightingale as well as organizations such as Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontieras, and the Red Cross slash Red Crescent movement can provide inspiring and positive examples for students to get to know and emulate. Efforts could also be undertaken to identify and highlight young and current heroes that might be more relatable to the current generation. The inspiring stories of role models such as Malala Yousafzai, Greta Thunberg, Ishmael Bia, and Nadia Murad can be used in short documentaries, YouTube video clips or comic books to reach and impact youth in both schools and universities, showing how everyone can make a significant difference in the world. Sports sports have the capacity to play a pivotal role in fostering communications and building bridges between communities in conflict. 92 in January 2014, the European Commission, in its recommendations to the European Parliament 93 suggested that sports be included in broader education efforts to build resilience against violent extremism. 94 specifically on PCVE. A study conducted in 2018 noted that sports-based programs had the capacity to build in vulnerable youth core life skills, which, in turn, are essential building blocks when it comes to preventing violent extremism. Point 95 In this regard, educational institutions have yet to fully exploit the positive role that many, but not all, sports can play in PCVE. Extracurricular activities within uniformed bodies clubs and societies organizations, societies, and clubs and schools and universities such as the Boy Scouts, 96 Girl Guides, 97 The Interact Club, 98 The Leo Club, 99 or Toastmasters 100 are already involved in trying to encourage their members to become agents of positive change who inspire others to action. 101 Through such bodies, Members are trained in life skills, leadership and citizenship 102 as well as skills to communicate and positively impact the lives of others. These organizations also actively encourage and promote social diversity and mixing in terms of race, culture and religion. Hence, recognizing the need for a sense of identity, adventure, self-worth, significance and security among young people. The programs and activities organized by these uniformed bodies, organizations, or societies could be leveraged upon to deter youth from embracing extremist ideologies. 103 Volunteerism Volunteerism is a powerful way for students to engage in something meaningful while also giving them a sense of significance. 104 Kroglansky and his colleagues did extensive research on how the quest for personal significance is a major motivational factor that has pushed some individuals towards violent extremism. Point 105 in this regard, volunteerism has the potential to allow students to contribute in a meaningful way to a cause that would give them a sense of purpose, citizens, and that the other, so often demonized by populists and extremists, 
is not so different. Point 110 Promoting religious and cultural literacy among students' ignorance and prejudice are powerful tools in the hands of violent extremists and terrorists. Misinformation and disinformation coupled with selective interpretations of religious texts and highlighting only certain negative news about another race, creed, or ethnicity has the potential to paint the other as the enemy responsible for everything conceivably wrong with one's own tribe. The only way to counter systematic brainwashing by extremists is to actively create awareness of the other as well as building bridges to them. In this regard, education via religious literacy is critical in promoting knowledge of others and in dispelling ignorance. According to Diana Moore, religious literacy can be defined as the ability to discern through multiple lenses and analyze the convergence of religious, social, political, and cultural spheres that have occurred throughout history. Point 112 The consequences of religious illiteracy, according to Moore, include fueling culture wars, curtailing historical understanding, and promoting religious and racial bigotry. These are the very triggers and drivers that have the potential to lead young people into the hands of extremists, who then skillfully manipulate and exploit grievances. Point 113 Besides educating students in schools and universities on the characteristics and contributions of people from other cultures, there should also be efforts to ensure that this education continues beyond the classroom. Field trips to the places of worship of other religions, community service in areas where the residents are of different ethnicities and cultures to that of the student, and visiting homes of people from other backgrounds could be systematically planned and implemented at various stages of students' educational journey, taking into account sensitivities involved. In the case of Malaysia, a national PCVE undergraduate program was carried out in January 2020 by the International Islamic University with support from the Ministry of Youth and Sports. The organizers conducted visits to various places of worship as part of the program. While there were initial reservations, briefing sessions followed by open and frank discussions before the visits were vital in getting the necessary buy-in from the participants and other parties involved. The feedback received from the participants was positive and the participating students felt that the visits promoted understanding, tolerance and respect. 114 The role of the teacher Paulo Freire, in his book Pedagogy of the Oppressed, introduces the term banking model of education which he describes as a form of education that is fundamentally one way only. In his model, instead of communicating, the teacher's function is simply to issue directives and provide information for the student. Under this banking concept of education, the student's responsibility was solely to receive, file, and store the deposits, 115 at present. However, the idea of education has evolved from a process of transferring knowledge from the teacher to the student to a more student-centered approach, wherein the student is more involved in the process of acquiring knowledge, skills, beliefs, values, and the culture of the society that he or she is placed in point 116 specifically when it comes to teaching elements of PCVE. It must be stressed that the transfer of knowledge is not the primary goal. Knowledge on counterterrorism, terrorism and extremism in general, and the violent radicalization process in particular, will be of little use in preventing a student from being indoctrinated and subsequently recruited. What is desired instead are the values transmitted to the student which are then internalized, i.e. accepted and believed, by the student and subsequently practiced and manifesting itself in the behavior of the student. For this process to take place, the role of the teacher is pivotal. Given this, when we look at turning the institution of learning as a channel to counter extremism, the teacher will be the focal point of this initiative, as they are in the unique position to affect change, impart affirmative messaging, or facilitate intervention activities due to their daily interactions with students. 117 However, given the range of responsibilities and the complexities involved, careful consideration should be undertaken when identifying and selecting the teachers intended to carry out these tasks. 
rather than training all teachers to undertake this responsibility, it would be worth considering selecting a handful of teachers in each institution of learning to be the focal point of this initiative. Teachers involved in counseling, psychology, or student affairs, given their closer dealings with students, could be potential candidates. However, given the magnitude of the problem of possible radicalization among the youth, there is also the possibility of considering all potential teachers undergoing their training to be at the very least exposed to the basics of PCVE and terrorism. The European Radicalization Awareness Network RAN, noted that schools should invest in basic training for all teaching staff not only those teaching politics, history, or ethics, so that they are equipped to detect the signs of radicalization and intervene effectively. 118 This could be done by ensuring that all participants in teacher training colleges are taught and are aware of the main issues pertaining to the radicalization process targeting young people. In this regard, while all teachers might not be given the responsibility of conducting PCVE initiatives in institutions of learning, all teachers would nevertheless still be aware of the fundamental issues involved and would be able to detect possible signs of radicalization which they can subsequently discuss with the trained specialized teachers. The training for specialist teachers would essentially be focused on equipping them with the skills to shift from just providing knowledge and information on a particular subject to that of being a guide or mentor facilitating the discussion on the subject of PCVE. Specifically, these teachers slash mentors slash guides would play a vital role and therefore need to be trained in 1. Setting the scene and preparing a safe space to discuss the subject. Two building trust to allow the students to openly share their views, fears, and concerns. 3. Maintaining their own credibility to ensure the best chance for the students to consider and adopt the material being presented. 4. Displaying calmness and composure when confronted with difficult issues and questions. 5. Exhibiting humility to avoid students from feeling patronized and belittled in any way. And 6 demonstrating gentleness, creativity, and even a sense of humor to maximize the impact of the content imparted to the students. Firstly, the teachers would set the scene when it comes to introducing the subject to the students. They would play a crucial role in assessing the environment, background, and impact of violent extremism and terrorism on the students before even presenting the content. In this regard, Teachers would be trained to contextualize the issues based on the particular time and setting in which the students find themselves. Secondly, the teacher would need to earn the trust of the students for them to feel safe to voice their fears, doubts, and concerns with regards to the issue. It must be stressed that winning the confidence and trust of the student is not immediate nor automatic, but there are steps that could be taught to teachers that could, in time, lead to the students bridging the trust deficit that might possibly exist. Thirdly, given the sensitivity of the subject material, teachers must maintain their credibility at all times. Hence, it is of paramount importance that their intentions, words, and behavior, not only when teaching the subject per se, but as a whole, does not exhibit any signs of racism, bigotry, or prejudice.119 in the event that they do, any hope of building a mental and emotional firewall through the material presented would be lost and could even aggravate the situation, leading to further polarization. Fourthly, given the controversies surrounding this issue, teachers should be prepared and trained to face difficult and perhaps even hostile questions, comments, and opinions with calmness and composure. It is in this sometimes hostile environment that teachers can and should take the opportunity to impart the valuable example of dealing with opposing views held by difficult individuals. Calmness and composure will not only be essential when dealing with controversial and emotionally charged issues, but could possibly form the basis which students can use as an example when they in turn have to deal with difficult people themselves. Fifthly, teachers should display humility when presenting PCVE content to ensure that the students do not end up feeling patronized or belittled. 
Oftentimes, the manner in which PCVE content is presented to students is typically one of a master-disciple dynamic. To become messengers on the issue of PCVE. Among the possible people that the youth look up to include actors, singers, sports personalities, 134, and social media influencers. Getting celebrities to speak on issues of national and international interests is not new, as seen in the case of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, appointing Angelina Jolie as a special envoy in April 2012.135 Not only do these celebrities have a large following and reach, online as well as offline, but they also have the charisma and pull to get messages across to the young people. While not all celebrities would be suitable and there would be some who are suitable but might not be interested, there would certainly be those who are both well suited to speak on PCV issues to the youth and willing to take upon that role. In Malaysia, PCV programs targeting university undergraduates have experimented with using local celebrities including singers, YouTube influencers, beauty queens, sports personalities, and television actors to both attract young people and present them positive messages linked to PCV. With considerable success, point 136 the need for education to reclaim social media, a 2013 RAND study highlighted that the internet has increased the opportunities for an individual to become radicalized and can also act as an echo chamber 137 in many cases point 138 education must play a role in reclaiming social media from extremists not just by learning and understanding the basics of electronic intelligence and cybersecurity 139 but also by fully exploiting the internet's potential in pcv a possible reason the internet has oftentimes been cited in playing a role in the radicalization process could simply be due to the content imbalance in favor of the violent extremist or terrorist narrative when compared to more moderate and balanced views. Simply put, on certain issues, violent extremists and terrorists, together with their sympathizers and supporters, appear to offer far more attractive content, both in terms of quantity and quality, targeting young people on the internet. Given this scenario, efforts have been undertaken by various specialized organizations to correct this imbalance by putting out counter and alternative narratives to that of violent extremists. The Sawab Center 140 in the United Arab Emirates, UAE, and the Global Engagement Center, GC 141 in the US are two good examples. However, their actual, as opposed to intended, audience might not necessarily be vulnerable young people and their ability to reach out to youths from different cultures and geographical locations might prove to be challenging given their affiliations and backgrounds. In this regard, the education sector would be remiss if it opts to solely rely on specialized strategic communications organizations to play the role of countering and debunking the narratives of violent extremists. In such circumstances, the education sector could take a leading role in conceptualizing strategies to ensure that students are better equipped when being targeted by extremists over the internet. The first step for the education sector would be to ensure that all PCV-related content be digitalized and repackaged into attractive formats, digital comics, video animation, online games, and quizzes, formats that appeal to the young generation. This would encourage students to reach out to other sources than those disseminated by terrorist groups and their supporters. This could possibly contribute to correcting the content imbalance we see at present. Secondly, institutions of learning, particularly universities, could start initiating programs in which countering the narratives of violent extremists are taught to undergraduates. This, in turn, would be followed by the undergraduates themselves starting to develop and disseminate their own narratives. In this regard, the author was involved in organizing the Students' Leaders Against Youth Extremism and Radicalization Slayer, workshops which brought 100 university undergraduate leaders from various races, religions and cultures from all over Malaysia together over a period of two and a half days in April 2017. The participants were trained in the workshops to conceptualize, develop, and disseminate digital PCV products. 
With their assistance, the Southeast Asia Regional Center for Counterterrorism SARCCT, doubled and later tripled its capacity to produce PCV-based digital content. Point 142. It is also significant to note that PCV narratives and messaging coming from the young people themselves carry more credibility in convincing their fellow peers when compared to messages solely developed by educational authorities. An emphasis on getting the youth to both create and disseminate counter and alternative narratives should be part of a larger effort to train students to be positive social media influencers 143 and digital storytellers and reach out to their fellow digital peers. Finally, education will only reclaim social media if the authorities are willing to seek genuine cooperation and collaboration with young people. Numerous digital PCV initiatives targeting the youth are facilitated by bureaucrats who are out of touch with the intended target audience, do not understand the messaging habits of young people, are not recognized by the young people as being credible messengers and do not even themselves use the digital media utilized by the youth. For educational institutions to make an impact via social media, the students should not be seen as mere clients but rather as partners, with both sides having the common objective of preventing and countering violent extremism. Inculcation of mental and emotional firewalls in students the education sector could conceptualize, develop, and impart both mental and emotional firewalls into the hearts and minds of the students. In this regard, certain values, skill sets and awareness such as critical thinking, empathy, diversity, resilience, and awareness on the failures of violent campaigns and the power of nonviolent social movements should be developed and institutionalized into the education system. These firewalls could provide a barrier against the radicalization process targeting the students. Firewall 1. Critical thinking institutions of learning such as schools and universities should play an essential role in developing and facilitating critical thinking among their students to enable them to make sound choices and decisions when confronted with the ideology, rhetoric, and propaganda of violent extremists. Point 144. All students should be taught basic cognitive skills such as how to distinguish facts from opinions, identify unstated assumptions and biases in an argument, evaluate the reliability of evidence presented to them, etc. 145. Critical thinking can be integrated in almost every subject, e.g. civic education, religious studies, languages, science, and philosophy. This is essential as skills like critical thinking allow the youth to see multiple perspectives before coming to a well-reflected perspective of their own. Point 146 Firewall 2 Empathy Empathy has been defined as the capacity to understand and feel what another person is experiencing. It also includes the capacity to place oneself in another person's position and act altruistically towards persons in need. Experts are of the opinion that if empathy and compassion are nurtured, extremism could be reduced and with that, the propensity for violence diminished. Point 147 However, it is also significant to note that empathy needs to be taught in a nuanced and balanced manner. If empathy is only extended to one's own group, whether racial, religious, or political, it can actually make an individual justify acts of violence to the other group. Point 148 Hence, when PCV programs focus solely on enhancing empathy for one's own group, there is a potential for conflict escalation. However, if the PCV intervention develops a balance between the empathy felt for members of one's own group and empathy felt towards the suffering of outsiders, individuals are less likely to inflict violence on the other 149 hence. The education system needs to conceptualize and implement a curriculum and syllabus that can instill a sense of empathy and solidarity not only with members of one's own group, but also extends emotional bonds to members of the other groups at home and abroad. Firewall 3. Diversity Diversity can be defined as a range or variety of different things. In the context of human behavior, it would include an understanding that every individual is unique and recognizing and appreciating individual and group differences. 
The United Nations Development Program UNDP, considers the rejection of diversity in society as one of the drivers of violent extremism. 150 hence, in multiracial, multireligious, and multi-ethnic societies, accepting diversity is Conclusion The reality on the ground suggests that violent extremists often look at educational institutions as a potential threat to their existence. Hence, the increase of lethal attacks upon schools and universities in many parts of the world. Somewhat paradoxically, terrorist leaders also look at educational institutions in terms of their recruiting potential for both foot soldiers and future leaders of their organizations. Authorities have, in many cases, been slow in protecting the infrastructure of educational institutions from physical attacks and even slower to protect the hearts and minds of the students from radicalization efforts by violent and non-violent extremists. More often than not, PCVE has been given a narrow role in educational programs, oftentimes limited to a single standalone module presented to the students. However, education has a tremendous potential of playing a far bigger and pivotal role in PCVE amongst young people, given the lengthy duration that most children spend in educational institutions. Most governments have yet to realize this opportunity to prevent radicalization. There is therefore an urgent need to revisit the role of education in PCVE in institutions of learning and, wherever possible, expand and strengthen the education sector's mandate, resources, and delivery mechanisms to become a primary source for PCVE among the youth. Thomas Corrath Samuel is a consultant with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, ANAC.